Chapter Twenty One A of The Golden Bough, Sections One to Seven. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For further information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Golden Bough by Sir James Fraser, Chapter Twenty One, Tabooed Things. One, the meaning of taboo. Thus, in primitive society, the rules of ceremonial purity observed by divine kings, chiefs, and priests agree in many respects with the rules observed by homicides, mourners, women in childbed, girls at puberty, hunters and fishermen, and so on. To us these various classes of persons appear to differ totally in character and condition. Some of them we should call holy, others we might pronounce unclean and polluted. But the savage makes no such moral distinction between them. The conceptions of holiness and pollution are not yet differentiated in his mind. To him the common feature of all these persons is that they are dangerous and in danger and the danger in which they stand, and to which they expose others, is what we should call spiritual or ghostly, and therefore imaginary. The danger, however, is not less real because it is imaginary. Imagination acts upon a man as really as does gravitation, and may kill him as certainly as a dose of prussic acid. To seclude these persons from the rest of the world, so that the dreaded spiritual danger shall neither reach them nor spread from them, is the object of the taboos which they have to observe. These taboos act, so to say, as electrical insulators, to preserve the spiritual force with which these persons are charged, from suffering or inflicting harm, by contact with the outer world. To the illustrations of these general principles, which have been already given, I shall now add some more, drawing my examples first from the class of tabooed things, and second from the class of tabooed words. For, in the opinion of the savage, both things and words may, like persons, be charged or electrified, either temporarily or permanently, with the mysterious virtue of taboo and may therefore require to be banished for a longer or shorter time from the familiar usage of common life. And the examples will be chosen with special reference to those sacred chiefs, kings and priests, who, more than anybody else, live fenced about by taboo as by a wall. Tabooed things will be illustrated in the present chapter, and tabooed words in the next. 2. Iron tabooed. In the first place, we may observe that the awful sanctity of kings naturally leads to a prohibition to touch their sacred persons. Thus, it was unlawful to lay hands on the person of a Spartan king. No one might touch the body of the king or queen of Tahiti. It is forbidden to touch the person of the king of Siam under pain of death, and no one may touch the king of Cambodia for any purpose whatever without his express command. In July 1874 the king was thrown from his carriage, and lay insensible on the ground, but not one of his suite dared to touch him. A European coming to the spot carried the injured monarch to his palace. Formerly no one might touch the king of Korea, and if he deigned to touch a subject, the spot touched became sacred, and the person thus honoured had to wear a visible mark generally a cord of red silk, for the rest of his life. Above all, no iron might touch the king's body. In 1800, King Tien Song Tai Wang died of a tumour in the back, no one dreaming of employing the lancet, which would probably have saved his life. It is said that one king suffered terribly from an abscess in the lip, till his physician called in a jester, whose pranks made the king laugh heartily, and so the abscess burst. 
Roman and Sabine priests might not be shaved with iron, but only with bronze, razors, or shears, and whenever an iron graving tool was brought into the sacred grove of the Arval brothers at Rome, for the purpose of cutting an inscription in stone, an expiatory sacrifice of a lamb and a pig must be offered, which was repeated when the graving tool was removed from the grove. As a general rule, iron might not be brought into Greek sanctuaries. In Crete, sacrifices were offered to Menedemus without the use of iron, because the legend ran that Menedemus had been killed by an iron weapon in the Trojan War. The Archon of Plataea might not touch iron, but once a year, at the annual commemoration of the men who fell at the Battle of Plataea, he was allowed to carry a sword, wherewith to sacrifice a bull. To this day a Hottentot priest never uses an iron knife, but always a sharp splint of quartz, in sacrificing an animal or circumcising a lad. Among the Ovambo of south-west Africa, custom requires that lads should be circumcised with a sharp flint. If none is to hand, the operation may be performed with iron, but the iron must afterwards be buried. Among the Mokis of Arizona, stone knives, hatchets, and so on have passed out of common use, but are retained in religious ceremonies. After the Pawnees had ceased to use stone arrowheads for ordinary purposes, they still employed them to slay the sacrifices, whether human captives or buffalo and deer. Amongst the Jews no iron tool was used in building the temple at Jerusalem, or in making an altar. The old wooden bridge, Pons Sublicius, at Rome, which was considered sacred, was made and had to be kept in repair, without the use of iron or bronze. It was expressly provided by law that the temple of Jupiter Liber at Furfo might be repaired with iron tools. The council chamber at Kidzicus was constructed of wood without any iron nails, the beams being so arranged that they could be taken out and replaced. This superstitious objection to iron perhaps dates from that early time in the history of society when iron was still a novelty, and as such was viewed by many with suspicion and dislike. For everything new is apt to excite the awe and dread of the savage. It is a curious superstition, says a pioneer in Borneo, this of the Dusuns, to attribute anything, whether good or bad, lucky or unlucky, that happens to them, to something novel which has arrived in their country. For instance, my living in Kindram has caused the intensely hot weather we have experienced of late. The unusually heavy rains which happened to follow the English survey of the Nicobar Islands in the winter of 1886 to 1887 were imputed by the alarmed natives to the wrath of the spirits at the theodolites, dumpy levellers, and other strange instruments which had been set up in so many of their favourite haunts, and some of them proposed to soothe the anger of the spirits by sacrificing a pig. In the seventeenth century a succession of bad seasons excited a revolt among the Estonian peasantry, who traced the origin of the evil to a water-mill which put a stream to some inconvenience by checking its flow. The first introduction of iron ploughshares into Poland, having been followed by a succession of bad harvests, the farmers attributed the badness of the crops to the iron ploughshares, and discarded them for the old wooden ones. To this day the primitive Baduwis of Java, who live chiefly by husbandry, will use no iron tools in tilling their fields. The general dislike of innovation, which always makes itself strongly felt in the sphere of religion, is sufficient by itself to account for the superstitious aversion to iron entertained by kings and priests, and attributed by them to the gods. Possibly this aversion may have been intensified in places by some such accidental cause as the series of bad seasons which cast discredit on iron ploughshares in Poland but the disfavour in which iron is held by the gods and their ministers has another side. Their antipathy to the metal furnishes men with a weapon which may be turned against the spirits when occasion serves. 
as their dislike of iron is supposed to be so great that they will not approach a person and things protected by the obnoxious metal, iron may obviously be employed as a charm for banning ghosts and other dangerous spirits, and often it is so used. Thus in the highlands of Scotland the great safeguard against the elfin race is iron, or better yet, steel. The metal in any form, whether as a sword, a knife, a gun-barrel, or what not, is all-powerful for this purpose. Whenever you enter a fairy dwelling, you should always remember to stick a piece of steel, such as a knife, a needle, or a fish-hook, in the door, for then the elves will not be able to shut the door till you come out again. So, too, when you have shot a deer, and are bringing it home at night, be sure to thrust a knife into the carcass, for that keeps the fairies from laying their weight on it. A knife or a nail in your pocket is quite enough to prevent the fairies from lifting you up at night. Nails in the front of a bed ward off elves from women in the straw, and from their babes. But to make quite sure, it is better to put the smoothing iron under the bed, and the reaping hook in the window. If a bull has fallen over a rock and been killed, a nail stuck into it will preserve the flesh from the fairies. Music discoursed on a Jew's harp keeps the elfin women away from the hunter, because the tongue of the instrument is of steel. In Morocco, iron is considered a great protection against demons. Hence it is usual to place a knife or dagger under a sick man's pillow. The Singhalese believe that they are constantly surrounded by evil spirits, who lie in wait to do them harm. A peasant would not dare to carry good food, such as cakes or roast meat, from one place to another, without putting an iron nail on it to prevent a demon from taking possession of the viands, and so making the eater ill. No sick person, whether man or woman, would venture out of the house without a bunch of keys, or a knife in his hand, for without such a talisman he would fear that some devil might take advantage of his weak state to slip into his body. And if a man has a large saw on his body, he tries to keep a morsel of iron on it as a protection against demons. On the slave coast, when a mother sees her child gradually wasting away, she concludes that a demon has entered into the child, and takes her measures accordingly. To lure the demon out of the body of her offspring, she offers a sacrifice of food, and while the devil is bolting it, she attaches iron rings and small bells to her child's ankles, and hangs iron chains round his neck. The jingling of the iron and the tinkling of the bells are supposed to prevent the demon, when he has concluded his repast, from entering again into the body of the little sufferer. Hence many children may be seen in this part of Africa weighed down with iron ornaments. 3. Sharp Weapons Tabooed There is a priestly king to the north of Zengui in Burma, revered by the Soti as the highest spiritual and temporal authority, into whose house no weapon or cutting instrument may be brought. This rule may perhaps be explained by a custom observed by various people after a death. They refrain from the use of sharp instruments, so long as the ghost of the deceased is supposed to be near, lest they should wound it. Thus among the Eskimos of Bering Strait, during the day on which a person dies in the village, no one is permitted to work, and the relatives must perform no labour during the three following days. It is especially forbidden during this period to cut with any edged instrument, such as a knife or an axe, and the use of pointed instruments, like needles or bodkins, is also forbidden. This is said to be done to avoid cutting or injuring the shade, which may be present at any time during this period, and, if accidentally injured by any of these things, it will become very angry and bring sickness or death to the people. The relatives must also be very careful at this time not to make any loud or harsh noises that may startle or anger the shade. We have seen that in like manner, after killing a white whale, these Eskimos abstain from the use of cutting or pointed instruments for four days, lest they should unwittingly cut or stab the whale's ghost. 
The same taboo is sometimes observed by them when there is a sick person in the village, probably from a fear of injuring his shade, which may be hovering outside of his body. After a death, the Rumanians of Transylvania are careful not to leave a knife lying with the sharp edge uttermost, so long as the corpse remains in the house, or else the soul will be forced to ride on the blade. For seven days after a death, the corpse being still in the house, the Chinese abstain from the use of knives and needles, and even of chopsticks, eating their food with their fingers. On the third, sixth, ninth, and fortieth days after the funeral, the old Prussians and Lithuanians used to prepare a meal, to which, standing at the door, they invited the soul of the deceased. At these meals they sat silent round the table and used no knives, and the women who served up the food were also without knives. If any morsels fell from the table, they were left lying there for the lonely souls that had no living relations or friends to feed them. When the meal was over, the priest took a broom and swept the souls out of the house, saying, Dear souls, ye have eaten and drunk. Go forth, go forth. We can now understand why no cutting instrument may be taken into the house of the Burmese pontiff. Like so many priestly kings, he is probably regarded as divine, and it is therefore right that his sacred spirit should not be exposed to the risk of being cut or wounded whenever it quits its body, to hover invisible in the air, or to fly on some distant mission. 4. Blood Tabooed we have seen that the Flamen Dialis was forbidden to touch or even name raw flesh. At certain times a Brahman teacher is enjoined not to look on raw flesh, blood, or persons whose hands have been cut off. In Uganda, the father of twins is in a state of taboo for some time after the birth. Among other rules, he is forbidden to kill anything or to see blood. In the Peleo Islands, when a raid has been made on a village, and a head carried off, the relations of the slain man are tabooed, and have to submit to certain observances in order to escape the wrath of his ghost. They are shut up in the house, touch no raw flesh, and chew beetle over which an incantation has been uttered by the exorcist. After this, the ghost of the slaughtered man goes away to the enemy's country in pursuit of his murderer. The taboo is probably based on the common belief that the soul or spirit of the animal is in the blood. As tabooed persons are believed to be in a perilous state, for example the relations of the slain man are liable to attacks of his indignant ghost, it is especially necessary to isolate them from contact with spirits, hence the prohibition to touch raw meat. But, as usual, the taboo is only the special enforcement of a general precept. In other words, its observance is particularly enjoined in circumstances which seem urgently to call for its application. But apart from such circumstances, the prohibition is also observed, though less strictly, as a common rule of life. Thus, some of the Estonians will not taste blood, because they believe that it contains the animal's soul, which would enter the body of the person who tasted the blood. Some Indian tribes of North America through a strong principle of religion, abstain in the strictest manner from eating the blood of any animal, as it contains the life and spirit of the beast. Jewish hunters poured out the blood of the game they had killed, and covered it up with dust. They would not taste the blood, believing that the soul or life of the animal was in the blood, or actually was the blood. It is a common rule that royal blood may not be shed upon the ground. Hence, when a king or one of his family is to be put to death, a mode of execution is devised by which the royal blood shall not be spilt upon the earth. About the year 1688, the Generalissimo of the army rebelled against the king of Siam, and put him to death, after the manner of royal criminals, or as princes of the blood are treated when convicted of capital crimes, which is by putting them into a large iron cauldron, pounding them to pieces with wooden pestles, because none of their royal blood must be spilt on the ground, it being, by their religion, thought great impiety to contaminate the divine blood by mixing it with earth. 
When Kublai Khan defeated and took his uncle Nayan, who had rebelled against him, he caused Nayan to be put to death by being wrapped in a carpet and tossed to and fro till he died, because he would not have the blood of his line imperial spilt upon the ground or exposed in the eye of heaven and before the sun. Friar Rickold mentions the Tartar maxim, one Khan will put another to death to get possession of the throne, but he takes great care that the blood be not spilt. For they say that it is highly improper that the blood of the great Khan should be spilt upon the ground. So they cause the victim to be smothered somehow or other. The like feeling prevails at the court of Burma, where a peculiar mode of execution without bloodshed is reserved for princes of the blood. The reluctance to spill royal blood seems to be only a particular case of a general unwillingness to shed blood, or at least to allow it to fall on the ground. Marco Polo tells us that in his day persons caught in the streets of Kambaluk, or Peking, at unseasonable hours were arrested, and if found guilty of a misdemeanour, were beaten with a stick. Under this punishment people sometimes die, but they adopt it in order to eschew bloodshed, for their batsies say that it is an evil thing to shed man's blood. In West Sussex people believe that the ground on which human blood has been shed is accursed, and will remain barren for ever. Among some primitive peoples, when the blood of a tribesman has to be spilt, it is not suffered to fall upon the ground, but is received upon the bodies of his fellow tribesmen. Thus, in some Australian tribes, boys who are being circumcised are laid on a platform formed by the living bodies of the tribesmen, and when the boy's tooth is knocked out as an initiatory ceremony, he is seated on the shoulders of a man, on whose breast the blood flows and may not be wiped away. Also the Gauls used to drink their enemies' blood and paint themselves therewith. So also they write that the old Irish were wont, and so have I seen some of the Irish do, but not their enemies, but friends' blood, as, namely, at the execution of a notable traitor at Limerick, called Murrah O'Brien, I saw an old woman, which was his foster-mother, take up his head whilst he was quartered, and suck up all the blood that ran thereout, saying that the earth was not worthy to drink it, and therewith also steeped her face and breast, and tore her hair, crying out and shrieking most terribly. Among the Latuka of Central Africa, the earth on which a drop of blood has fallen at childbirth is carefully scraped up with an iron shovel, put into a pot along with the water used in washing the mother, and buried tolerably deep outside the house on the left-hand side. In West Africa, if a drop of your blood has fallen on the ground, you must carefully cover it up, rub and stamp it into the soil. If it has fallen on the side of a canoe or a tree, the place is cut out and the chip destroyed. One motive of these African customs may be a wish to prevent the blood from falling into the hands of magicians, who might make an evil use of it. That is, admittedly, the reason why people in West Africa stamp out any blood of theirs which has dropped on the ground, or cut out any wood that has been soaked in it. From a like dread of sorcery, natives of New Guinea are careful to burn any sticks, leaves, or rags which are stained with their blood, and if the blood has dripped on the ground, they turn up the soil, and if possible, light a fire on the spot. The same fear explains the curious duties discharged by a class of men called Ramanga, or Blue Blood, among the Betsileo of Madagascar. It is their business to eat all the nail parings and to lick up all the spilt blood of the nobles. When the nobles pare their nails, the parings are collected to the last scrap and swallowed by these Ramanga. If the parings are too large, they are minced small, and so gulped down. Again, should a nobleman wound himself, say, in cutting his nails, or treading on something, the Ramanga lick up the blood as fast as possible. Nobles of high rank hardly go anywhere without these humble attendants. But if it should happen that there are none of them present, the cut nails and the spilt blood are carefully collected, to be afterwards swallowed by the Ramanga. 
there is hardly a nobleman of any pretension who does not strictly observe this custom, the intention of which, probably, is to prevent these parts of his person from falling into the hands of sorcerers, who, on the principles of contagious magic, could work him harm thereby. The general explanation of the reluctance to shed blood on the ground is probably to be found in the belief that the soul is in the blood, and that therefore any ground on which it may fall necessarily becomes taboo or sacred. In New Zealand anything upon which even a drop of a high chief's blood chances to fall becomes taboo or sacred to him. For instance, a party of natives, having come to visit a chief in a fine new canoe, the chief got into it, but in doing so a splinter entered his foot, and the blood trickled on the canoe, which at once became sacred to him. The owner jumped out, dragged the canoe ashore opposite the chief's house, and left it there. Again, a chief, in entering a missionary's house, knocked his head against a beam, and the blood flowed. The natives said that in former times the house would have belonged to the chief. As usually happens with taboos of universal application, the prohibition to spill the blood of a tribesman on the ground applies with peculiar stringency to chiefs and kings, and is observed in their case long after it has ceased to be observed in the case of others. 5. The head tabooed. Many people regard the head as peculiarly sacred. The special sanctity attributed to it is sometimes explained by a belief that it contains a spirit which is very sensitive to injury or disrespect. Thus the Yorubas hold that every man has three spiritual inmates, of whom the first, called Olori, dwells in the head and is the man's protector, guardian and guide. Offerings are made to this spirit chiefly of fowls, and some of the blood mixed with palm oil is rubbed on the forehead. The Karens suppose that a being called the Tso resides in the upper part of the head, and while it retains its seat, no harm can befall the person from the efforts of the seven Kelas, or personified passions. But if the Tso becomes heedless or weak, certain evil to the person is the result. Hence the head is carefully attended to, and all possible pains are taken to provide such dress and attire as will be pleasing to the Tso. The Siamese think that a spirit called Kuan or Kwan dwells in the human head, of which it is the guardian spirit. The spirit must be carefully protected from injury of every kind. Hence the act of shaving or cutting the hair is accompanied with many ceremonies. The Kwan is very sensitive on points of honour, and would feel mortally insulted if the head in which he resides were touched by the hand of a stranger. The Cambodians esteem it a grave offence to touch a man's head. Some of them will not enter a place where anything whatever is suspended over their heads, and the meanest Cambodian would never consent to live under an inhabited room. Hence the houses are built of one story only, and even the government respects the prejudice by never placing a prisoner in the stocks under the floor of a house, though the houses are raised high above the ground. The same superstition exists among the Malays, for an early traveller reports that in Java people wear nothing on their heads, and say that nothing must be on their heads, and if any person were to put his hand upon their head, they would kill him and they do not build houses with stories, in order that they may not walk over each other's heads. The same superstition as to the head is found in full force throughout Polynesia. Thus of Gatanewa, a Marquesan chief, it is said that to touch the top of his head, or anything which had been on his head, was sacrilege. To pass over his head was an indignity never to be forgotten. The son of a Marquesan high priest has been seen to roll on the ground in an agony of rage and despair, begging for death, because someone had desecrated his head, and deprived him of his divinity, by sprinkling a few drops of water on his hair. But it was not the Marquesan chiefs only whose heads were sacred. The head of every Marquesan was taboo, and might never be touched, nor stepped over by another. Even a father might not step over the head of his sleeping child. 
women were forbidden to carry or touch anything that had been in contact with or had merely hung over the head of their husband or father no one was allowed to be over the head of the king of tonga in tahiti any one who stood over the king or queen or passed his hand over their heads might be put to death until certain rites were performed over it, a Tahitian infant was especially taboo. Whatever touched the child's head while it was in this state became sacred and was deposited in a consecrated place, railed in for the purpose at the child's house. If a branch of a tree touched the child's head, the tree was cut down, and if in its fall it injured another tree so as to penetrate the bark, that tree also was cut down as unclean and unfit for use. After the rites were performed, these special taboos ceased, but the head of a Tahitian was always sacred. He never carried anything on it, and to touch it was an offence. So sacred was the head of a Maori chief, that, if he only touched it with his fingers, he was obliged immediately to apply them to his nose, and snuff up the sanctity which they had acquired by the touch, and thus restore it to the part from whence it was taken. On account of the sacredness of his head, a Maori chief could not blow the fire with his mouth, for the breath being sacred communicated his sanctity to it, and a brand might be taken by a slave or a man of another tribe, or the fire might be used for other purposes, such as cooking, and so cause his death. 6. Hair tabooed when the head was considered so sacred that it might not even be touched without grave offence, it is obvious that the cutting of the hair must have been a delicate and difficult operation. The difficulties and dangers which, on the primitive view, beset the operation are of two kinds. There is first the danger of disturbing the spirit of the head, which may be injured in the process, and may revenge itself upon the person who molests him. Second, there is the difficulty of disposing of the shorn locks. For the savage believes that the sympathetic connection which exists between himself and every part of his body continues to exist even after the physical connection has been broken, and that therefore he will suffer from any harm that may befall the severed parts of his body, such as the clippings of his hair or the parings of his nails. Accordingly, he takes care that these severed portions of himself shall not be left in places where they might either be exposed to accidental injury, or fall into the hands of malicious persons who might work magic on them to his detriment or death. Such dangers are common to all, but sacred persons have more to fear from them than ordinary people, so the precautions taken by them are proportionately stringent. The simplest way of evading the peril is not to cut the hair at all, and this is the expedient adopted where the risk is thought to be more than usually great. The Frankish kings were never allowed to crop their hair. From their childhood upwards they had to keep it unshorn. To pull the long locks that floated on their shoulders would have been to renounce their right to the throne. When the wicked brothers Clotaire and Childebert coveted the kingdom of their dead brother Clodomir, they inveigled into their power their little nephews, the two sons of Clodomir, and having done so, they sent a messenger bearing scissors and a naked sword to the children's grandmother, Queen Clotilde, at Paris. The envoy showed the scissors and the sword to Clotilde, and bade her choose whether the children should be shorn and live, or remain unshorn and die. The proud queen replied that if her grandchildren were not to come to the throne, she would rather see them dead than shorn. And murdered they were by their ruthless uncle Clotaire with his own hand. The king of Bonape, one of the Caroline Islands, must wear his hair long, and so must his grandees. Among the Hoes, a negro tribe of West Africa, there are priests on whose head no razor may come during the whole of their lives. The God who dwells in the man forbids the cutting of his hair on pain of death. If the hair is at last too long, the owner must pray to his God to allow him at least to clip the tips of it. The hair is in fact conceived as the seat and lodging place of his God, so that were it shorn, the God would lose his abode in the priest. The members of a Maasai clan 
who are believed to possess the art of making rain, may not pluck out their beards, because the loss of their beard would, it is supposed, entail the loss of their rain-making powers. The head chief and the sorcerers of the Maasai observe the same rule for a like reason. They think that were they to pull out their beards, their supernatural gifts would desert them. Again, men who have taken a vow of vengeance sometimes keep their hair unshorn till they have fulfilled their vow. Thus of the Marquesans we are told that occasionally they have their head entirely shaved, except one lock on the crown, which is worn loose or put up in a knot. But the latter mode of wearing the hair is only adopted by them when they have a solemn vow, as to revenge the death of some near relation, etc., in such case the lock is never cut off until they have fulfilled their promise. A similar custom was sometimes observed by the ancient Germans. Among the Chatti, the young warriors never clipped their hair or their beard till they had slain an enemy. Among the Toradjas, when a child's hair is cut to rid it of vermin, some locks are allowed to remain on the crown of the head as a refuge for one of the child's souls. Otherwise the soul would have no place in which to settle, and the child would sicken. The Karobataks are much afraid of frightening away the soul of a child. Hence, when they cut its hair, they always leave a patch unshorn, to which the soul can retreat before the shears. Usually this lock remains unshorn all through life, or at least up to manhood. 7. Ceremonies at Hair-Cutting but when it becomes necessary to crop the hair, measures are taken to lessen the dangers which are supposed to attend the operation. The chief of Namosi in Fiji always ate a man by way of precaution when he had had his hair cut. There was a certain clan that had to provide the victim, and they used to sit in solemn council among themselves to choose him. It was a sacrificial feast to avert evil from the king. Among the Maoris many spells were uttered at hair-cutting. One, for example, was spoken to consecrate the obsidian knife with which the hair was cut. Another was pronounced to avert the thunder and lightning which hair-cutting was believed to cause. He who had his hair cut is in immediate charge of the atua, or spirit. He is removed from the contact and society of his family and his tribe. He dare not touch his food himself. It is put into his mouth by another person, nor can he for some days resume his accustomed occupations or associate with his fellow men. The person who cuts the hair is also tabooed. His hands having been in contact with a sacred head, he may not touch food with them or engage in any other employment. He is fed by another person with food cooked over a sacred fire. He cannot be released from the taboo before the following day, when he rubs his hands with a potato or fern root, which has been cooked on a sacred fire, and this food having been taken to the head of the family in the female line, and eaten by her, his hands are freed from the taboo. In some parts of New Zealand the most sacred day of the year was that appointed for hair-cutting. The people assembled in large numbers on that day from all the neighbourhood. End of section 7